Uh, this is a chart, just kind of an outline of the liver, which is essentially the detox lifeline of the body. A lot of people talk about, and obviously there's many organs that involve detoxification, the kidneys and, you know, the bowels of excretion. And people can say the skin and things, but the liver really seems like it's the, the big thing with phase one and phase two detox. So phase one is essentially the, you know, preparation phase with the cytochrome P450 enzymes and oxidation and then takes it to phase two where it conjugates. And this is where a lot of the fancy words that people have probably heard before, glucuronidation, you know, like the whole glutathione and methylation and acetylation and sulfation and things happen. But the, the point of why I wanna bring this up, right? So it's taking a fat soluble toxin, making it water soluble, is generally from a clinical standpoint, the weak link in somebody's health is not necessarily phase one or phase two, it's what's called phase three. Phase three is the elimination, which primarily 80% of it is preferred to go down the bile. So the bile is made by the liver. It's also made in the bile ducts. And then uh, toxins are processed through phase one, phase two in the liver, as you see, but then it's got to go somewhere. If it can't go anywhere, that's usually the weak link in somebody's health journey is things aren't flowing. They're not draining. So it's not necessarily detox is the problem, but it's actually the drainage that can often be the problem that can then back up. So if, if phase one or phase two has got nowhere to go, right, to dump it into the bile, then it gets backed up. If phase two gets backed up, guess what? Phase one gets backed up. If phase one and two are backed up, then you're not detoxifying. And it's not necessarily because there's a problem always with phase one and phase two. Oftentimes it's actually the bile excretion, the phase three of the liver is usually the weak point. So as you look at the bile, it basically is almost like a branches of a tree, really small. And then they just get into bigger, bigger trunks before it basically just, you know, combines with the pancreatic duct. And then that dumps into the small intestine. And then that that's where those toxins get in the bowels. And then, you know, hopefully you poop them out. Um, but with with this, it's the movement. The movement is key. And so as I look at what are the you know, key takeaways with the liver and with, with the bile uh, movement is bile is released to assist in digestion of fats and neutralize acidity. So if you have low stomach or if you have a lack of stomach acid, meaning I'm not producing enough, oftentimes it's actually because of a lack of bile. So if there's not enough stomach acid, it's typically because there's not actually enough bile movement coming in to neutralize the acidity. So the body naturally puts less stomach acid. So instead of trying to increase stomach acid, um, you know, always with digestion is kind of the functional medicine approach is really going to the next stage of getting the bile flowing and moving will actually help the stomach acid. And when you have low amounts of stomach acid, that's poor digestion. And it's also a gateway just for microorganisms too, where, you know, if you can't, can't break that down. And then there's some pretty cool research on um, what's part of slowing bile flow down. So the, the technical term for slow bile flow is cholestasis. So when you see estrogen induced cholestasis, basically what that means is that high amounts of estrogen being estrogen dominant actually has been shown to slow bile movement down. Now what's inter interesting with this is your um, preferred method of actually excreting estrogen is through the bile. But if you have too much, it can actually clog up the bile. So keeping the bile moving can be very beneficial with helping with hormones. Um, so anybody that's struggling with hormone imbalances and estrogen dominance is a pretty common and a um, major thing that's going on right now. I mentioned glyphosate earlier too. Glyphosate is sprayed all over the place. It's in rainwater. It's in you know, newborn babies, they're finding it pretty much everywhere. CDC, actually, I should have put this in there. CDC, I think it was about three weeks ago, did uh, a study and they just released that they looked at almost 3000 individuals and there was a third of them or a quarter of them where I think were like kid ages too. And 80% of the people that they survey and they try to pick a wide geographic area to kind of cover what would be the mass population percent. So it wasn't just a select area. Uh, but 80% of them had glyphosate in their urine. And so that was just within the last uh, few weeks. But this paper came out in 2013 and just showing that glyphosate impairs bile acid synthesis and secretion, uh, basically shutting down phase one. So when you're exposed to glyphosate, we obviously want to detox and detox it through the liver and process it out. But glyphosate actually slows that whole process down and actually impairs the bile movement. So not only slows phase one down, but it also slows um, 
slows the excretion down too. And you know, gallbladders, which the surgical name for removal of a gallbladder is cholecystectomy. That's what you see kind of toward that bottom of the last bullet point. But on average, there's about three quarters of a million individuals per year getting a gallbladder out. But here's what I thought was interesting with this research. They said up to 15% of the population of the United States has asymptomatic gallstones, meaning you have no symptoms. You have no idea that there's gallstones in the bile. Gallstones in the bile happen when there's a lack of flow, lack of movement. So motion is life. Movement in that bile is really important. And they said 20 to 25 million Americans have gallstones and you know three quarters of a million undergo um, a gallbladder removal. And I can tell you that, you know, it advanced Tudka, taking Tudka, and Tudka is an acronym, so T-U-D-C-A. Everybody pretty much says Tudka because the the long name, which is Torso deoxycholic acid, is just a mouthful to say, right? Torso deoxycholic acid. So we always just say Tudka, but it's basically helping to open up that liver and bile ducts. And I put a picture here of the drainage funnel. And the the thing to understand is there's a difference between drainage and detoxification. Detox is I'm going to grab on to chemicals, pull them out of the body. Drainage are the normal pathways that just need to flow and move. The, the base of that funnel you see at the bottom there is the colon. That means if you're not pooping, if you're trying to detox at the cellular level or the mitochondrial level or try to flush your limb for flush your liver, if the colon's not moving, it's backing everything up. It's basically clogging up that sink. And that's when reactions happen. That's where herxine and having symptoms really will occur. And so one of the most common places that I see clinically to actually be clogged up in this funnel is the liver and bile duct system. And when that's clogged up uh, and or the colon and, and it backs everything else up, basically from a literature standpoint, they, um, there's this thing called the blood bile barrier where instead of the, the toxin byproducts dumping into the bile, going into the um, you know, small intestine, large intestine, and you know, pooping them out, essentially it gets sent into the blood circulation. When it gets sent in the blood circulation, that's when people develop rashes, itchiness in the skin. That's when kidney problems occur, lungs. So in the, in the literature, they call it endothelial damage of the kidneys and the lungs. And it's basically just because the drainage pathways are clogged. So if your goal in listening today is like, oh, I want to really move my lymphatic system. The key thing to understand is that the liver and bile ducts have to be moving and the colon has to be moving in order for the lymphatic system to drain and move. So we don't, um, you know, we don't, we just need to understand that there's multiple pieces with the body. Advanced Tudka is one of the strongest uh, things really to open up the bile flow. And I pulled some research and there's definitely, I mean, just, we actually have to update our document. We have a 26 page PDF uh, document. There's like 194 references. We actually have to add to it, but I just cherry pick some because obviously, you know, 194 different citations is a little overwhelming. But when you're looking at Tudka, it actually helped you to excrete bile. So bile will oftentimes get recycled because it's expensive energy wise for the body to make. So when you take Tudka, it actually helps you to excrete more to get rid of those toxins to flush them out. The second one there, Tudka stimulates bile flow, increases by 250%. Again, motion is life. You want to keep movement there. Tudka also helps to improve actually the quality of it. So it's not just making more bile. It's, it's actually making better quality and improving the flow of it. And then the bottom one there just talks about restoring protein folding cell apoptosis, which um, is quite big, especially in the, in the cancer world. Um, looking at the brain category, this is really cool research from 2020. Tudka shows a similar effect to intermittent fasting in terms of improving cognitive function. So if you intermittent fast because you, you know, want to biohack and turn the brain on, you can actually take Tudka and it'll show a similar effect of intermittent fasting as far as cognitive function, even if you do eat. Um, if you take, if you, you know, have a stroke, um, well, this is more likely to actually protect it, but if you have one, it's going to reduce the damage by 50%. That's the second one there. And then, uh, MS amazing in that category, same thing with Parkinson's. Uh, so it's obviously very, very awesome. And our body naturally makes Tudka. It's a secondary bile acid, but it's made by the microbiome in the gut. And most people, um, from a health perspective, the, the gut is very, um, not well, and there's not good bacteria. So the body's 
when you're not well, you don't make Tudka. Tudka is an anti-inflammatory and it actually protects the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is why you see research all over the place here from you know cardiovascular and the cancer world to liver, and I'll show you, you know, diabetes in a second. It's just really beneficial. But most times when you're not well, uh, you're actually not making this. This is why it's such a helpful thing as a supplement to get it into your body. Um, Tudka sharply reduces the number of cells that die during a heart attack. Uh, so if you, you know, taking that and unfortunately have a heart attack, it'll prevent damage from that. This, the last one there, Tudka, when given after a heart attack, has been shown to shut down enzymes that cause improper uh, protein folding, minimize scarring, and help to ease less myo uh, myocardial dysfunction. So heart heart dysfunction is what that's showing. And then just some more research on diabetes. Uh, reports improving hyperglycemia, which is basically high blood sugar associated with type one and type two diabetes. Um, Tudka, the second one there, Tudka improved diabetes, induced severe albuminuremia and podocyte injury in the kidneys. So it's very helpful in the kidneys with high blood sugar. Tudka also has been found, the last one, to help regulate fatty acid breakdown and help regulate insulin resistance. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, when you take some time, if you go on PubMed or just do some deep diving in Tudka, which is, you can see on the screen there, Torso deoxycholic acid in the parentheses. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, the research that's out there, it's one of my favorites, used it for years. I pretty much brought it to the functional medicine uh, world probably seven years ago. Um, and it's a water soluble bile acid, and it really helps to move phase three liver. Uh, so I'm, I'm putting it in here with the liver because that's its primary mode, but it does so many other things. Now, when you're looking at the ingredients, a couple of things that we mix in here, N-acetylcysteine, uh, melatonin, fulvic acid. So the fulvic acid is the carbon technology, along with when you're looking at the other ingredients, it says polysaccharides. That's part of the carbon technology. Melatonin, when you hear about melatonin, you think, oh, this is for before bed, it's to fall asleep. No, melatonin here is actually used as a driver. So it won't make anybody uh, uh, fall asleep. The way that we have it um, connected to this Tudka molecule is that it's basically used as a driver. Melatonin is essentially one of the strongest antioxidants out there. That's why it's so beneficial to have awesome sleep because it's when your body heals and restores and all that. Um, but when you're taking advanced Tudka with the melatonin, it's not gonna make you tired. It's used as a driver. And melatonin can actually, um, get down into the mitochondrial level. So that's really the reason that we're using that. And then inosyl cysteine is just a really good combination with the Tudka to really help that liver uh, side and support. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would love to see that PDF. So I'll hit up your, I got somebody on your side. I'm going to find that because I'd love to read more about Tudka. But I recently wrote a pretty detailed article on Tudka and I was going to focus primarily, I thought I was going to be focused primarily on bile, the liver detoxification. And you posted a few links there for, for brain health and cardiovascular. It's no joke. This whole presentation could have been on research around Tudka and different body systems and different benefits and different things that I couldn't even honestly figure out the mechanisms on how some of them are related, but um, it is a powerful systemic uh, addition to anybody's protocols. And it's something I've been taking consistently for about five years, probably. And uh, I switched to yours a couple years ago. And we used it also in my wife's protocol because rice she's reactive to. Um, and every other product had rice in it. Um, Tutka product that we had found before. And so um, I was also skeptical of the melatonin because um, I thought it would make me sleepy and it definitely does not. And I, my non-alcoholic fatty liver was diagnosed by ultrasound. So this was not going by ALT and AST numbers. And it was about 18 months from someone telling me you have mild to moderate fatty liver to your liver looks awesome. And I did a couple other things, but this was twice a day, part of my own regimen through that time. And I have also noticed the cognitive uh, brain clarity type, uh, I don't want to call it symptoms, effects, positive effects uh, from it as well. So um, yeah, it's it's really pretty incredible stuff. Yeah, it's it's really an um, amazing formula. The What I believe really why we get such a huge systemic 
positive response is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that's within inside the cell protecting that because that's in many, many cells within the body. So I think that's the primary mechanism of why it's uh, so beneficial uh, throughout the body. But it is, uh, it is a strong product, meaning it, it, it's going to open up the bile. And when I say strong, most people with chronic illness, the bile is not flowing. So if I, if, the analogy that I love to give is if you have a fire hydrant and you have a hose hooked up to it and the hose has been sitting out in a hot place, let's say where I'm at, Puerto Rico, and it's been outside for a few years, well, that hose is going to kind of, you know, not be the most flexible. It's probably going to shrink a little bit. If I just crank the fire hydrant on, that hose is probably not going to handle it. And that's the analogy of many people that are struggling with health issues have poor bile duct system, which is essentially kind of the hose that's been sitting out in the sunshine. So a little bit goes a long ways. I always recommend to actually take this with food, especially when you start off. Um, and the standard dose and you can see is one capsule twice a day. I, I don't recommend to open the capsule up. Um, it, it's nothing, nothing's harmful about it if it's just mixed in water, but Tudka is the most bitter substance you will probably ever taste, which is why it's so beneficial for the liver. Um, it is, it's almost like unpalatable. The one thing that I have seen parents do is they'll slice strawberries and then sprinkle it on. And that's for kids that'll help cut some of that, you know, bitterness, um, and make it palatable. It's no joke. I've tried it. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I recommend leave it in the capsule. So, uh, one cap twice a day there. And, and if you're sensitive, just once with a meal, you know, once a day. And as far as side effects, potentially just too effective right away. So meaning that it's, it's kind of opening that fire hydrant up. So again, a little bit goes a long ways, uh, but it is, I mean, when you look at literature, I just did a deep dive, even on all the ingredients with, you know, pregnancy, which is obviously, um, you know, very cautious time. All the ingredients are safe, even for pregnancy. It's just the fact that, you know, opening the bile up when somebody's never maybe had it moving great and they're pregnant, it's like, well, you know, I'd always err on the side of being cautious. All literature says it's fine and, and whatnot. Same thing with the biotoxin binder, it'd be fine. But I always recommend, you know, um, being a lot more conservative in, in the pregnancy side of things. Less is more, especially in, in that case. Um, and it's just, it opens pathways up really well. So I think that's really the only side effects. I mean, it is very protective, very safe, um, but it's, it's just, it's an effective